Hello, and welcome to Protecting Patient Privacy, a HIPAA staff training. We're here today to help your organization build a culture of compliance. My name is Michael McCoy, and I am your instructor today. Nothing in here should be considered legal advice. I am not an attorney, and we do not hire any attorneys at our firm. However, the recommendations you are going to receive today come from Health and Human Services, the Office for Civil Rights, and other government organizations involved with helping your office comply with HIPAA. We'll be using a lot of different terms today, such as HHS or DHHS, the Department of Health and Human Services. CMS stands for Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. OCR, the Office for Civil Rights. Malware, all classes of malicious software including viruses, ransomware, trojans, all kinds of different malicious softwares that can affect your computer. Meaningful use, MIPS, promoting interoperability, all require a security risk assessment as part of your receiving funds. Willful neglect. Here's where we really want to help you not be in willful neglect for your organization. Willful neglect is a conscious, intentional failure or reckless disregard to the obligations you have to comply with HIPAA and protect patient privacy. Always remember that HIPAA is federal law. And HIPAA is enforced by Health and Human Services, Office for Civil Rights. HIPAA can also be enforced by your local state attorney general. HIPAA protects PHI, Protected Health Information. Protected health information can be oral, written, or electronic. And it is an identifier matched with payment, treatment, or healthcare operations information. The identifiers are broad in nature and include the patient's name, their address, email address, social security number, and other identifiers, including their license plate. Pay, take particular notice of number 18 here, unique identifying numbers, characteristics, or codes. I have a lot of offices tell me we're not texting PHI because we're using a code for the patient. No, under the identifiers, that is listed as being protected health information. Treatment generally means the provision, coordination, and management of care for that patient. Payment covers all of the activities where you are obtaining payment and receiving payments from the patient. Healthcare operations is a broad term covering the administrative, legal, financial, and improvement activities of your organization where they involve patient information. EPHI stands for Electronic Protected Health Information, and that is the information stored on your computer, in your electronic health record, or on other digital media. SPHI, or Sensitive Protected Health Information, is protected health information that could cause harm or embarrassment to a patient financially, reputationally, or emotionally. Examples would be HIV testing, whether the result was negative or positive, a pregnant minor, or a patient has an STD. Sensitive protected health information requires additional protections by your organization. Minimum necessary is the key protection of the HIPAA privacy rule. It requires that we only use or disclose the minimum amount of patient information needed for its medically intended purpose. Minimum necessary does not apply to all circumstances, including the request by another provider for health information, a disclosure to the patient, or if the patient has signed a valid authorization. Minimum necessary also does not apply to disclosures to Health and Human Services or the Office for Civil Rights. Minimum necessary does apply to you that you only review the minimum amount of patient information needed for your job requirement. Another part would be not to ask for the whole chart if you do not need the entire chart from another organization or practice. If you do, do not let minimum necessary get in the way of you providing good patient care. Most importantly, minimum necessary standard applies directly to you so that you cannot access your own, family, or friend's medical records without the proper authorization from your HIPAA compliance officer. Just because you have access 
does not give you the right to access. You must follow the same policies and procedures that a patient would. The Office for Civil Rights states that violation of this minimum necessary standard should include a sanction that could include termination. A recurring topic today will be that documentation is your key to HIPAA compliance. Everything pretty much must be in writing when it comes to HIPAA. Documentation is critically important anytime you have a breach. A breach is an impermissible use or disclosure of patient information. And all breaches are presumed to be a breach, no matter how small you think they may be. So when you have a suspected breach or an actual breach, you are required to do a breach of risk assessment. Again, a breach is an impermissible use or disclosure of patient information. Somebody saw this patient's information that didn't have a medical reason to do so. So misdirected communications, faxing to the wrong doctor's office, a very common breach. Make sure we fill out a breach risk assessment. Giving the patient their information and uh, including another patient's information with it. I hear this one all the time. Patient asks for their progress notes. Another person in the office printed out another patient's prescription. You took them off the printer, stapled them together, handed them to the patient. The next day the patient calls and says, I got my progress notes. I got another patient's prescription. Those are breaches that we must document and record. Employee snooping is another breach that must be documented. And remember that paper records can be breached as well if they are improperly disposed of. Instead of putting them in the shred container, they're put in the trash bin instead. Those are breaches and we must do the breach risk assessment that we will go over next. When we have a breach or a suspected breach, we must do a breach risk assessment. Put in a brief summary of the description of what happened. These are the four questions that are required by federal law. What was the nature and extent of the protected health information? In other words, what was the PHI? What were the identifiers? And what was any payment, treatment, or healthcare care operations information that was breached? Number two, who actually saw that information? Was it a organization? Was it a, a person uh, that you can put it down to? Was it a staff member? Put in the name of the person. Were they a HIPAA-covered entity? If yes, then mark yes. Was the protected health information actually acquired or viewed? In most cases, you will know that the answer is yes if you are filling out this form. But there may be times where you put no or it was unknown, such as if we had scanned in information to the wrong patient's chart and they could have gone in and seen that information if they had accessed the portal. That requires further investigation. Number four, the actions taken to mitigate the extent of the risk to the protected health information. So did we send it to the wrong doctor's office? Did they shred it for us? And then we got it to the right office. If we gave it to the wrong patient, because we have to send the patient whose information was breached a letter, we would like to get that back from that patient so that we can inform the patient that they return that. This is very critical that we fill out these four questions and return this form to our HIPAA compliance officer there is no breach or suspected breach too small for you to document these four questions. It'll take you less than 60 seconds and is a valuable piece of documentation to show that you are building that culture of compliance and complying with HIPAA. There are gonna be breaches of PHI in your office every day. Other patients are gonna overhear other patients' information. As long as the information was incidental to a proper disclosure, the Office for Civil Rights states that that is incidental disclosure. But for your organization to have this incidental disclosure applied, you must have reasonable safeguards and be following the minimum necessary standard. Part of that reasonable safeguards and the minimum necessary policy includes that you have a clean desk policy in your office. Make sure that you are not leaving patient information out where other patients can see it. Uh, with your computer monitors, make sure that if you are not there, that you do not wait for it to time out, but hit Control L to log off that computer so that, again, those incidental disclosures are kept to a minimum. We need a privacy rule. 
and a great portion of the privacy rule involves the patient's privacy rights. And they do have a lot of them that we're going to go over. The right to access, the right to request that you amend their medical record. They can request confidential communications or an accounting of disclosures. The right to restrict information that you may otherwise give out. And they have the absolute right to restrict information to their health plan if they pay you out of pocket for that service. Of course, all patients should receive their notice of privacy practices, which goes over their right to file a privacy complaint. A main component of the privacy rule is the patient's right to access or get copies of their medical records. A patient may access or get copies of all medical records you have on that patient. This may be different from what you've thought of in the past. The patient has a right to what's called the entire designated record set. All the records your office maintains on that patient, whether they were produced by your office or they came from a different office, hospital, or radiology facility. You may require that the patient use your access or authorization form to request their information, but a patient, again, has a right to all protected health information maintained by your office. A few years back, the Office for Civil Rights put out the HIPAA Right of Access Initiative. In that, they stated that patients do have a right to the entire designated record set. Bayfront Hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida, did not follow that access guidance. The patient wanted the underlying raw data from a test that they had performed, and the hospital felt that the report was sufficient. Since the hospital did not give the patient all of the medical records in the designated record set, they received an $85,000 fine. Another part of the HIPAA Right of Access Initiative is that patients get their information in whatever form and format that your office can reasonably produce. That means if you have a USB drive or a thumb drive on your computer, the patient has a right to their medical records in on a thumb drive. You could never accept a thumb drive from the patient. To protect all of your patient records, you would have to purchase a thumb drive and resell it with the medical records to the patient following the access guidance that you only charge your actual cost. The Office for Civil Rights and their access initiative gave three different methods that you can charge patients for copies of their medical records. You can use the actual cost or you can do a flat fee. The flat fee is set at a maximum of $6.50. That would include postage and any other charges. You could also use average cost. To help your practice with larger files requested by patients, we have developed a patient charge notification sheet because the access guidance says that the patient has a right to find out how you determined your cost for their medical records. Do not overcharge for medical records. The Office for Civil Rights and their access guidance also meant that any digital format includes emailing to patients. You are required to email a patient their medical records upon their request. Do understand that email is a dangerous method of sending email. Therefore, you must warn the patient that the email could be seen or intercepted and they must accept that risk. If they do, we have a disclaimer that you can put on that email that shows the patient was warned and they accepted the risk. You are allowed under the access guidance to charge $6.50 for emailing a patient their records. Many practices have told us they do not want to email a patient records because it's unsafe. The Office for Civil Rights gave out its second HIPAA right of access initiative fine to a practice that would not email a patient their records. In addition to not emailing the patients their records upon their request, they also told them that they would print them out and that they would have to pay the state allowable charge for their medical records. This violates the HIPAA access guidance in two ways. One, you must email a patient records upon their request. And two, you cannot charge the state allowable. You must impose the fee guidance allowed by the HIPAA access initiative and that is again the 650 flat fee 
for your actual cost. So please do not make the mistake and, an eight, and risk an $85,000 fine. Follow the instructions and email or fax a patient their records upon their request. There are going to be times when your patient is not able to make it into your office. Either they are elderly and unable to make the, the visit or they have moved away from your office. Therefore, HIPAA, the access guidance, does require that you have a verification process to identify that patient when they cannot come into your office for them to get copies of their medical records. Make sure your office has a verification policy and when used, it is documented in the patient's record. Again, under the Access Guidance Initiative, you may not impose unreasonable measures or burdens and barriers on a patient getting access to their medical records. One of the, that we hear the most is that, well, we require all patients to use the patient portal. As not all patients will have access to, the, access to that portal, you cannot make this a requirement of your office. It's always great to suggest it, but you cannot require that to be done. Also, mailing records would cause an unreasonable delay. So again, you must have convenient ways and methods of identifying and delivering medical records to your patients. Patients have a right to access their medical record directly on one of your computers. You have up to 30 days to accommodate this request and understand you cannot leave them alone as they could go into other records and you cannot charge them for this visit. The Access Initiative sets a 30-day limit for you to get the patient their medical records requested. However, if the records are kept solely in the EHR, you should be and are expected to accomplish this request much faster. While we are on the patient's right to access, this is a good time to let you know about permitted uses and disclosures of protected health information. There are only three types of ways that you can disclose records under the HIPAA laws. One, required to the government uh, through HHS OCR. Remember that government does not include law enforcement. Law enforcement must have a subpoena to access a patient's records. Permitted. One of the most under misunderstood parts of HIPAA is that we can share records with other practices for continuity of care. So many practices will require you to get an authorization signed by the patient. And although that is an additional protection for the patient, in most cases, it is not required and not recommended. So do understand that if a practice who referred a patient to you requested records, you have the absolute right to send those patient records over without an authorization being signed by the patient. Authorized, if the patient has signed a valid authorization form, make sure you check the nine elements that must be on that authorization form, then they can release their records to whoever they want. Other permitted uses of disclosures of PHI are for serious threats to the health and safety, essential government functions, and also to workmen's compensation. Authorization forms are critical for the proper release of patient records. Now, remember that authorization forms are very legalistic. That means they have nine elements that must be included before you can release those records. An example of an element is that it must have an expiration date. Without an expiration date, even though completely filled out and signed by the patient, it would not be valid. Also understand that authorizations require a second step for the release of sensitive protected health information. So the authorization itself cannot state that all sensitive protected health information would be released when it's signed by the patient. The specific SPHI that wanted to be released, the patient would have to perform a second step, initial, check mark, or otherwise note that that information can be released along with this authorization. Communicating with family and friends. Even though HIPAA requires healthcare providers to protect patient privacy, providers are permitted in most circumstances to communicate with family and friends or other involved with the patient's care or payment there is a guide put out by the OCR that you see on the screen. This guide is intended to clarify these HIPAA requirements so that healthcare providers do not unnecessarily withhold a patient's health information from these persons. Review this guide 
that will summarize the relevant questions and requirements that you may have on disclosing patient information to family and friends. Disclosures to family, friends, and caregivers. The document that we just referenced gives you a lot of good examples of what you can and cannot discuss with those involved with the patient's care. A good example is an emergency room doctor may discuss your treatment in front of you when you asked your friend to come into the treatment room. When a patient brings someone into the room, they have given you implicit approval that you can discuss matters in front of them. Another example would be when at the hospital, uh, the patient's daughter comes in and goes over the charges. That would be allowable, especially when the patient is nearby and could object to that if they wanted to. And again, providing good patient care is a part of HIPAA. If the doctor feels that the person you brought with you should know that you need to keep your foot raised while going home, they can give that patient that information. It's not a free-for-all. You can't go into that patient's entire medical history and information, but you can discuss with the caregiver what information is necessary for them to help the patient under those circumstances. If you have a patient that is incapacitated, unconscious, or unable to make a reasonable judgment on their behalf, then HIPAA does allow you to share directly information to the family or friends with their involvement in that patient's care or payment of care. Understand that as soon as the patient regains consciousness or the ability to make a valid decision, you must ask their permission before proceeding. The HIPAA privacy rule gives patients the right to request an amendment to their medical records if they feel the information is inaccurate or incomplete. Make sure to have the patient write down on a form their request to amend the record and give it directly to the healthcare professional. They can then decide if the record will be amended to include this information or if it is going to be rejected. If rejected, we must notify the patient via mail why we denied the request to amend the record and give them an opportunity to put in a brief statement of disagreement. So here's a question for you. Is your practice allowed under HIPAA to call a patient with an appointment reminder or test results if they have not signed an authorization allowing you to do so? And the answer is yes. It is good health care to call patients and remind, remind them of their patients or to let them know that test results are in. Apply minimum necessary. If the patient does not pick up the phone or an answering machine picks up, then you can leave the minimum information necessary. You can leave that the patient has an appointment with your office at 2 o'clock next Tuesday afternoon. You can leave a message, your test results are in, please call our office to review. If a patient asks for confidential communications, we must abide by that request as long as they give us a valid method of contacting them. So the patient might state that they want nothing going to their home or their home phone number, but give you a valid P.O. box to send any information or billing statements to. That is the patient's right to request confidential communications. Patients have a right to an accounting of disclosures for all disclosures outside of payment, treatment, or health care operations. This would include items such as a court subpoena or state-required reporting of certain conditions. Patients have a right to request one accounting of disclosures at no charge from your office once per year. The disclosure that you must maintain should include the date that the disclosure was made, the name of the recipient and address it was sent to, a brief description of the PHI that was disclosed, and the purpose of that disclosure. Patients have an absolute right to restrict information from their health plan that they pay you out of pocket for. This does not include Medicare and Medicaid, but does include all commercial insurances. Patients have a right to request restrictions on who you give information to. A good example of this would be when you go in for surgery, after that surgery, the doctor goes out and talks to your family and friends that are gathered to discuss what happened through the surgery. You have a right to request that the doctor restrict that information. Doctor, I do not want my family and friends to know what went on in my surgery. I want you to come in, 
talk to me, I will disclose to them what information they need to know. We should always accept a patient's request for restrictions when available and when possible. If there is a serious or imminent threat of danger to the patient and telling the person with them would help to alleviate that threat, that is the only time we can override a patient's request for restriction. All patients have a right to receive your notice of privacy practices. It's an important disclosure that lists how you share, use, and go over the patient's rights with them. Included in the notice of privacy practices is the right for the patient to file a privacy complaint. You want to make sure that your office has a privacy complaint form so that if a patient has a valid HIPAA complaint that they complain to your office and not directly to the Office for Civil Rights because an investigation is required once reported to the OCR. Healthcare cybersecurity. An important part of your job function is to understand and be aware that cyber criminals are constantly attacking your systems and wanting to gain access to your patient records. The government instituted the HIPAA security rule to help practices observe good security practices. The security rule requires you to have automatic logging off of your computers after a period of inactivity. Sanctions must be applied for violations of your privacy and security policies and procedures. Complex passwords are a must. Information access should be limited to what you need, again, that minimum necessary standard for your job function. Remember that there are audit reviews of your activity to the patient records. Your office manager or HIPAA compliance officer must review your access, making sure that it was all appropriate. And we must also make sure that workforce clearance procedures are in place amongst other requirements of the HIPAA security rule. For your part, awareness is key. You must always be on the alert that someone may be trying to trick you use social engineering, or otherwise gain access to your network. There are many reasons that cyber criminals want to access your network. Ransomware, Medicare fraud, banking virus, stealing of patient records, using them for identity theft, compromising your computer and using it for crypto mining, all kinds of malicious activity that cyber criminals want to access your computers for. Cybersecurity is important for all of us to implement at work and at home. This site, Information is Beautiful, shows many of the world's largest data breaches that show you you do need to put more emphasis on protecting your personal information. Ransomware is currently hitting the healthcare industry very hard. Ransomware is a malicious software that will lock up your files and require the practice or organization to pay a ransom in order to get access to those files again. Right now, healthcare cybersecurity involves making sure your practice is prepared for a ransomware attack. As we were producing this training, a national cyber awareness system put out the following release, that the Mialto ransomware incidents are increasing and they are getting into systems by using phishing and password spray attacks. We'll talk more about these soon. Healthcare cybersecurity involves awareness and good cyber hygiene. Always think before you click, especially if it's an attachment or a hyperlink in an email. Never disable your security controls, such as your antivirus. If you're trying to do something and your computer tells you that the antivirus is getting in the way, make sure you get with IT before going forward. Do not install screensavers or other programs onto your system without approval from the IT department. And never plug in your cell phone. That is not the way to charge your cell phone when you are at work. Bring in a cube or other power supply so that you can plug directly into an electrical outlet. Leaving your computer, use that control L. And never leave a web browser open when you are not attending the computer. Also remember that paper contains protected health information on it and it must be handled properly. If you have a chart, a form, 
turn it over. If it's not in use, it should not be seen. Make sure that when you're throwing away any paper, including post-it notes with protected health information, then they need to go into the shred bin, not the trash bin. Clear your area of PHI before leaving for a break or for the end of the day. And if possible, lock your area. Turn it over, paper, turn it on, your screensaver, if you are leaving your workstation. Cyber criminals are taking advantage of social engineering tactics. Criminals take advantage of your human nature. You must defeat your natural inclination to trust and to want to be helpful. Because right now, the black market for stolen medical data is thriving. So some of the common deception methods used. Authority. If I call you and you say on your caller ID, McCoy Family Practice, I state that I am Dr. McCoy. I need a patient's records. Without doing any other verification, you may send those records to, that, to me. Do not trust caller ID. Always verify. If you did not know the patient was going to that doctor, you would want to verify that or actually get an authorization form before releasing those records. They like to be likable. They call you. They make a rapport with you. They get valuable information, so be very careful. Reciprocation. If I give you something, you naturally want to give me something in return. Think about it. Somebody compliments you, the first thing you want to do is compliment them back. Validation, your office manager. I'm from your IT company. I named that IT company. I throw out some names. You may think that I am who I say I am and give me information that I shouldn't because I've sounded familiar. Scarcity, limited time offer. You must act now. Those are common deception methods used by the cyber criminal. Criminals use tactics such as fear, urgency, curiosity, or sympathy to trick you into clicking on their link. And the word free is the greatest word in the English language. They like to use that to entice you to click. So be careful. Clickbait. Look at this. Something that you may be interested in and without thinking, you'll click on it. Social networking. Do not give out too much information over social networks that help criminals send you specific attacks that may affect work on you. Also understand that there are uh, many attacks that will say they're from the U.S. Department of Justice or the FBI Crime Division. And be very, very careful from emails. We will discuss this in depth. Remember that not all social engineering attacks are computer-based. Some of them may be over the phone. So over the phone, never give out your username and password even if the person tells you they're with the IT department. And currently, there are a lot of IRS phone scams going around, telling you that if you do not respond immediately, you will be arrested. Another common one that we see with our offices is the electric company calling to tell you that your electricity is going to be turned off at 3 o'clock. Well, we're seeing patients until 5. That would cause a major inconvenience, and uh, so we have to act immediately. Remember that studies show that phone scams work best right at closing or at lunchtime and that women scammers are more effective. Hey, it's almost 5 o'clock. I'm doing surveys. I've got to get one more survey in before I can leave. My kids are getting out of daycare. I really need your help. Would you please answer this survey for me? No. Uh, that survey is going to give out information that would help them launch a successful phishing attack on your practice. Most social engineering can be overcome if we stop, think about it, and use common sense. Trust your gut feeling. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. If it feels off, it probably is. Stop and think about what you're being asked. How did this person get my name, my phone number, my email address? So again, awareness is key. Cybercrime is thriving. Not because they're getting past your antivirus or your firewall, but because they are attacking the human element. So number one, we need to review all email coming in that contains an attachment or a hyperlink. Number two, you must create and maintain complex passwords for all systems 
where there may be electronic protected health information. And you must understand the dangers of internet usage in your office. A malicious code attached to it is an easy way for their cyber criminal to bypass your security controls. They use all kinds of events, natural disasters, epidemics, economic concerns. During holidays, you may also get a, a malicious email, a phishing email. So always be aware. Phishing emails are one of the most common ways that these social engineers, these cyber criminals, bypass your security controls. They get you to click on that attachment or hyperlink. So stop multitasking when you're opening emails that contain hyperlinks or attachments. You need to basically pay attention to that email. Why did I receive that? I'm not the person that deals with that vendor. Also check the return email address. If it looks like it's coming from FedEx and the return email address is Arnold Montgomery at gigantimedia.com, if those two don't match, you're not going to open that email. Films at radiologycenter.com. Okay, it looks good, but let's check the spelling. They spelled it with two Ds. Um, always check and read the email. Does it sound proper? Does it sound appropriate? If you are not 100% sure that this is a good email, do not open it. Contact your IT department and let them review it first. So again, always verify if you have any doubt any attachment or hyperlink. So common phishing emails, uh, a fake invoice, um, mail delivery failure message, a payment receipt, a fax receipt. One of my favorites, here's the payroll for the organization for this month. Uh, yeah, I want to know what everybody else makes. No, that's a very good enticement to show you. In this email here, coming from Bank of America. If you happen to bank with them and your account has been suspended, you have to click on this to reactivate it. No, your bank is not sending out those type of emails. Here we have another phishing email. Again, let's look at that return email address. This states that it's coming from Verizon, uh, but when I look at the return email address, it's at gsaq.com.mx. That's going outside of the country that's pretty uh, good indication that this is not really coming from Verizon. Lack of personalization for the account numbers below. Well, they expect that you're not going to go check and make sure that that is your account number. It's got this hyperlink for us to click on. Definitely don't want to do that. Now, here's one of my favorite tool tactics that they use. So if you feel you've been receiving this in error, we're going to give you a 1-800 number to call. Well, I called it and it was a uh, number for security alerts for elderly people. They put in that phone number to make the email look more legitimate. This is why we really have to stop and pay attention to emails. This email actually came from the sender that it was listed. However, what had happened in this case is that this person's email account had been compromised by the cyber criminal. So everything looked good. It was coming from the person the email address match, they personalized it with my name on there. And then, but if you read it, kindly request you to share the wire transfer details to process your future payments at the earliest. That just didn't sound right and gave me cause to think this didn't really come from Jennifer. It came from somebody who compromised Jennifer's account. So in this case, if I were to email back that information, the attacker would have redirected her inbox email to go to them instead of the recipient, and they would have then had my account information. So again, emails, you have to stop, think before you click. Here's another common tactic used by the cyber criminals. In this case, the employee was going to a website, a commonly used website by the practice, but mistyped one of the letters, and it took them to this page instead. This is a site that is trying to tell you that your Windows registration is not valid. And what they're really trying to do is get you to call the 1-800 number and you're going to say, hey, this is a valid copy of Windows, I need you to get it correct. They're going to tell you that you've got other problems and you need to buy support from Microsoft uh, for them to correct it before they can get this error screen off your computer. 
the last thing you want to do is click right in the middle where it says back to safety. That's going to be a hyperlink that's going to download malicious software onto your computer. So in this case, basically we want to use task manager and log out. Or if you're not familiar with how to do that or feel uncomfortable, again, get with IT before moving on. I know they're difficult to use, but passwords are your best defense at work and at home to protect your identity and the identity and information of your patients. A common method for cyber criminals to gain access to your network is to do a brute force or dictionary attack of passwords on your network. The truth is, is if you're not using a complex password, your password is probably one of the top 100,000 passwords that are used because the studies show that 99% of us not using a complex password have a very easy to guess password. So what makes a complex password? Well, an easy way is maybe to start with two unrelated words. Witty Apple. Now, four things I can do to make this into a complex password. One, add at least one capital letter. Number two, substitute a number for a letter. Number three, add at least two random numbers. And number four, always include a symbol in my password. So minimum of 10 characters, add length for even a stronger password. Once you have those passwords in place, and you should be using a complex password not only for access to the EHR, electronic medical record system containing patient information, but also to the Windows, the logon password that you use to get onto that computer, and make sure that our email passwords are also complex. Cyber criminals are targeting email accounts because once I get into an email account of one staff member, I now learn who the other staff members are and have enough information to do a successful spear phishing attack on the practice. So using those complex passwords, don't share them, don't use them with others. Don't use the same passwords at home that you use at work. Do not store your passwords under the keyboard or in the keyboard drawer next to the keyboard or in the drawer next to the keyboard. Also, unique usernames also protect your data because I have to have not only your password, but your username. And do not save your passwords in your internet browser. Cyber criminals have tools that allow them to access those passwords quickly. If you need to, use a password manager. LastPass is a good one. I have an IT professional that I trust thoroughly, and he uses the free version of LastPass and feels very comfortable with it. Now that you've put good password policies into place, I'm going to tell you now after 90 days, it's time to change that good complex password you created. Why? Well, here's a site that you can go to. This is a dark web search of your email address because we typically use that as our user ID. So I put in my own personal email on this. The dark web search revealed four organizations where I had used my email address as my username that had been compromised. That means that the cyber criminals have my username and password. So we want to make sure that we're changing our passwords every 90 days because no matter how good and safe we are with that password, places where we use it may be compromised and give the cyber criminals valuable information. An important part of this training today is to make sure everybody understands that security is everyone's responsibility. When you're on the internet, even if you're doing something legitimately for the organization, you must understand that there are certain items that you cannot give consent to. And in this case, we were looking for an article on HIPAA. It took us to Yahoo News. They told us that to read the article, we had to agree to their terms of service. Their terms of service went on to state that we give them the right to access and copy our data. So you could not click OK at your organization to give them the rights to access your company network. So be very careful when it comes to consent forms that you may have to uh, click on online. You may not always know if your computer has been infected, but here are some indications that something has gone wrong. One, you can't find files. 
Two, the computer has noticeably slowed down. Understand that if you feel something's wrong, you should report it immediately. Now, if you do think that you clicked on an attachment that you shouldn't have, make sure you power off your computer immediately. Disconnect that network cable from the computer and notify your supervisor. Have all staff members change all passwords and if necessary, contact local law enforcement and your IT. Mobile devices bring additional risk to electronic protected health information. So we should have standard procedures with any mobile devices, tablets or cell phones. Make sure you're requiring the device to automatically lock, that you've got a biometric or at least a six digit pin to, to access that device. Be very careful and only use secure Wi-Fi connections. Free Wi-Fi means that there are lots of opportunities for cyber criminals to access your information. If you are using a mobile device, tablet or cell phone that accesses patient information, either through text messaging or email, or you go directly have an app that to your EHR, you should read and sign the mobile device policy for your practice. It provides for good guidance to make sure that you are implementing the proper security measures and have been properly trained on the use of adding or having access to PHI on your device. When it comes to email containing any protected health information, it must be encrypted at rest and in transit. That includes emailing from provider to provider, emailing within your practice. When the patient sends an email to your practice, it is not protected health information when the patient sends it, but once you receive it and it's in your inbox, it must then be encrypted. So a lot of people say, well, why does my hospital send me uh, unencrypted email? Not everybody's HIPAA compliant, but you need to be. So one solution to have HIPAA compliant encrypted email is to use Microsoft Office 365 using their enterprise level three edition with an additional Azure protection. This will cost $22 per month per user. Not everybody in the office is gonna handle electronic protected health information in their email, so not everyone needs this level of a, a box, but for medical records and usually for the doctors and administrator, these are a requirement for you, your practice, your organization to be HIPAA compliant. An important part of the HIPAA security rule is the documentation and review of legitimate access to your medical records. In other words, a user audit trail showing what each staff member did, what records they went into, how long they were in those records, and what they did. Understand that this is an important precaution to make sure that only legitimate access to our medical records is being performed. And as a staff member, you should understand that your HIPAA compliance officer or their designee is performing a monthly report on your access to patient records. Medicare fraud and abuse is a serious problem that requires your attention. You play a vital role in protecting the integrity of the Medicare program. To com combat fraud and abuse, you need to know what to watch for to protect your organization from potential abusive practices, civil liability, and criminal activity. What is Medicare fraud? Medicare fraud is typically characterized by knowingly submitting false statements or making misrepresentations of fact to obtain a federal health care payment for which no entitlement would otherwise exist. Knowingly soliciting, paying, and or accepting remuneration to induce or reward, reward referrals for items or services reimbursed by the federal government programs and or making prohibited referrals for certain designated health services. Medicare abuse describes practices that either directly or indirectly result in unnecessary costs to the Medicare program. Abuse includes any practice that is not consistent with the goals of providing patients with services that are medically necessary, meet professionally recognized standards, and priced fairly. Examples of Medicare abuse include billing for services that were not medically necessary, charging excessively for services or supplies, and misusing codes on a claim such as upcoding or bundling codes. 
There are numerous Medicare fraud and abuse laws, including the False Claims Act, the Anti-Kickback Statute, Physician Self-Referral Law, also known as the Stark Law, the Social Security Act, and the United States Criminal Code. Be a part of the solution, not the problem. Report any suspected fraud or abuse to your office manager or physician. Here are some other resources on fraud and abuse. For more information on Medicare fraud and abuse, visit the Office of the Inspector General's website at httpsoig.hhs.gov slash fraud. If you're a covered entity or business associate, you're covered by HIPAA. And as a staff member there, it is your responsibility to help protect patients from the harm that a breach could cause. You're also helping to maintain the reputation of your practice. Remember with HIPAA, if it's not documented, it's not done. Please contact us if you do not have the necessary forms to comply with the HIPAA rules and regulations. HIPAA really is about providing good health care and at the same time, protecting the privacy of the patient information that we're entrusted with. HIPAA and Omnibus updates to HIPAA state that the goal is to improve the quality of health care. So always err on the side of providing good patient care. If it interferes or you feel it interferes with HIPAA, document what you did. And go to your HIPAA compliance officer or physician for more clarification. Thank you for your time and attention. We have a companion piece, HIPAA Essentials, that could answer most questions you have. If that doesn't, please contact your HIPAA compliance officer. If you do not have a copy of HIPAA Essentials, please email us at mm at hipaack.com and we'll be happy to get you a copy. Also, we have additional trainings on our YouTube channel. Just Google HIPAA TV on YouTube. This concludes our HIPAA training for today. If you need additional guidance, please contact us.